Hey everybody, welcome to this roundtable for episode four. This episode deals with entrepreneurship, specifically on how entrepreneurs identify a problem that people have and help solve that with some sort of a product or service. Then also how they end up needing to compete in order to improve their product or service and how that not only makes customers and their choice is better off, but other businesses as a whole actually improve because of that. So let's talk some of the inspiration for how we approach the writing for this episode. So Connor's book uh, had Shark Pool, you know, where the people come and pitch their ideas, their entrepreneurial ideas. And we took that and decided that we were gonna place it in the twins seeing a need when they go to the park that there is not food for the kids to eat when they're playing at the park. So they get this idea that they are gonna open their own corn dog stand. Hey, what's this show about? It's a show where entrepreneurs try to get money for things they've invented so they can grow their company and serve more people. Oh, so they're just copying that other show, Piranha Tank. The success of a show like Shark Tank has really shown that there's a much wider interest in entrepreneurship than there maybe has been in the past and people kind of learning about that even as kids and stuff and getting inspired. It's kind of a fun thing to see these successes happen and like a big investor come in and kind of make an entrepreneur's whole life change. And we didn't want to get sued by ABC, so we chose yeah, a different so we name. Chose <laughs> we chose another body of water. It's a That's shark right. pond. Or shark shark pond. <laughs> we present to you the park's very first food stand, a food stand that serves corn dogs to our hungry peers. We'll call it... Tunnel, Tunnel Dogs! dogs. So what the twins do is they scratch their own itch, right? They're hungry at the playground, sure, yeah. so they solve their own problem. Yeah. And ultimately, if it's a product uh, for a solution that you've been looking for, you're going to have more endurance in working mm. uh, to, uh, to come up with that product and to get it out there on the market. Yeah. Kellen saw a big need for himself, needing a good comedian to laugh at. <laughs> <laughs> no one is good at comedy. <laughs> <laughs> But what if I was? I could. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> in all seriousness, I have seven kids, and it was the same thing in my approach to the show. I'm, I'm making the show that I want, right? That I would have liked to have had as a kid, that I want for my kids. My grandkids are trying to come up with an idea for something to make and sell. We just don't know where to start, but we'd like to create something new. Ah, oh, yes. To cease to think creatively is to cease to live. I don't like the idea of inventing a product and investing like years of my life toward that one thing. That is not the type of entrepreneur that my skills naturally lend to. Right. So not everybody's skills are gonna go in that way, but there's also one thing I am super interested in is like supporting and investing in people that are doing things that I'm interested in and that I believe in. Mm -hmm. So even though I am not an entrepreneur in like the traditional way of like like a boss to a bunch of people or something. Starting a business, yeah. yeah, that doesn't sound good or interesting to me. I really like jumping on board with people who do do that and uh -huh. I support in that way. I'm like entrepreneurial uh, adjacent. <laughs> but that's important, I think, yeah. for kids to watch, right? As we've talked over the years about entrepreneurship, a lot of people think that means you need to start and run your own business. Right. When entrepreneurship, I think, is more of a mindset, and even if you're an employee on another business or a contractor working with another company, if you can think entrepreneurially, you're gonna have a lot of success because it really just means you're, you're problem solving. You're trying to be creative. You're trying to think outside the box. You see something that you can help with and so you bring those solutions rather than just waiting and being told what to do. Right. And I think that's a good lesson for kids is even around the house, right? Like what can you see around the house that you can go create value for your parents or for your family and help with? and you're gonna get rewarded when you do that. No, and this is also an episode where a little bit more of Ethan's character starts to come out, right? That he has this entrepreneurship mug in him where his smarts and his wisdom and stuff is different than Emily's. And obviously she's really into it as well, but he's like, oh, I've got this dream of becoming this entrepreneur that creates these products and solves all these kinds of problems for people. So for the kids watching, I think that's one of the big takeaways is entrepreneurship is, this is probably a new word for kids, but it's iterative meaning you go through these iterations. Yeah, that's a new word for the kids. Yeah, for the, just the kids. You guys knew what, what that word was. Yeah, for the kids. Please define <laughs> where, that. Where do you go through these iterations or this cycle where you're never gonna get it right the first time? It's right. always gonna be rough at first. It's always gonna be the, the least best version of it. 
Um, I write for every 20 jokes that I write, one of them stays in my act. It's just the process. It's something I never saw in any video growing up about Thomas Edison or these other inventors. All we saw was he invented the telephone, the phonograph, right. you know? But I love this moment in this episode where they're like, how do you just come up with good ideas? And Ben Franklin's like, I don't, you know? <laughs> and it back this curtain. It's like, yeah. here's everything that didn't work out. Yeah. Ooh, I've lost a lot of money. So we learned from Ben Franklin, and we moved on from there to learn from Annie Turnbull Malone. So it was you and another writer that kind of came with that idea of using her as a really good example. A couple of us did because she stands out in history for a couple reasons. She basically like started this whole industry of African-American women didn't have hair products that would work well with most of their hair. Right. And so she saw a need for herself and also for the larger world and larger community. So she did it, but she also then grew to become the first African-American woman to become a multimillionaire. Mm -hmm. And that's such a cool power claim. Yeah. Like, how cool is that? And then she also employed a bunch of other women that otherwise probably wouldn't have had work or wouldn't have been able to get work. It was at a time when that just, you know, wasn't super possible for a lot of women. And yeah, so it was neat just how her influence spread. And they also learned about the need to compete, right? To actually right. improve products. Yeah, so that's the thing too. She had competitors. She had a woman that once worked for her that went off and branched off on her own, right? Like, yeah. the competition comes. Yeah, but it ends up making everybody better off. And so they come back, they apply that to their, you know, their corn dog stand. And one of the things, one of the choices that we made in the episode was to have a lot of montages, like to the point that we make fun of it, like where grandma's like, who's up for another montage kind of a thing, because having gone through the process as entrepreneurs, it's, it is a process. So what are some of your favorite parts? Uh, I love that we think Copernicus sees grandma and the kids disappear, and uh -huh. really he's just looking at the swings. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The scenes are free. So it's kind of rare for a joke to be there in the first draft and then make it all the way through. It just mm -hmm. keeps working every time. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> kids, why so sad? <laughs> hey now, twins, why so glum? Was it Ben's big weird head? Partially, yes. It's just so random and funny. And I have laughed more by myself in my car to that <laughs> joke that you wrote early on than anything else. I love the part when they're going back in time revisiting Ben Franklin's uh, inventions. And when they're in the place with a Franklin stove, pe the people are like, what? And he's like, I thought they couldn't see us. <laughs> it's just like, it's sort of like, um, uh, going backwards on that trope that I've seen in every other educational thing where it's like, here we are in the 1500s and they're always just sort of these spectators, almost like they're there but they're viewing it like it's a TV show. Right. I don't like to brag, but I do. I'm Annie's assistant and biggest fan. Annie Turnbull Malone's assistant is a fun way for us to like get a lot of cool information out about Annie without making her seem too like conceited. Talk about right. herself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is something that we run into on every other episode. It, there are some characters like Ben Franklin where we know we just have leeway to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, can, then, he, would brag, he would brag about himself. <laughs> yeah. like, it was Ben Franklin. He was like, true. I don't need to be president and I'll still be on money. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yes. But then there are other characters where you feel like if you make them too goofy, you reduce the credibility. And yeah. so it's it's fun to sort of uh, find solutions around that. And for that it was this, it was Kelly creating the, yeah, this other character who could then be funny in place of Annie Turnbow Malone. Yeah. Some people have all the luck. Check yourself, boy. Luck had nothing to do with it. I'll take it from here, Zuzu. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm There's this montage at the end with Corinne, when she tastes one of the Tuttle Twins corn dogs for the first time and she goes into this like happy place. Like, that was a really fun one for me to do as a director. And I watched my girls watch that for the first time and they got a big kick out of it. So that's one of my favorite parts. Yeah. Hi, I'm Libby Sterling. And I'm Macy Sterling. And, and we, we are, are the founders, founders of Floss Cotton Candy. Foss Cotton Candy is a modern gourmet cotton candy business. We started as a little stand on the side of the road, and now we've grown to be in 38 grocery stores. When we were little, we looked at selling cotton candy on the side of the road as an opportunity to earn money over the summer. 
Then we attended the Utah Kids Entrepreneur Fair and realized it was earning a lot of money and so we should turn it into a new business. My favorite part about Floss Cotton Candy is that I always have a place to work. It's just super nice when I want to buy things. I always have a little way to earn money. My favorite part about Floss is always the creative and fun side of it. Coming up with flavors, making the labels, eating the cotton candy. <laughs> One of the challenges we've had with Floss Cotton Candy is coming up with the new flavors. When we first started making flavors, we would actually ruin the machines trying to come up with recipes because we had to make all new recipes. Something I've learned from Floss is that you can't do something big or even small in general if you don't actually work for it and put your whole self into it. Another thing I've learned from Floss Cotton Candy or having a business is that it's totally okay to make mistakes when you're learning. You just gotta pick up from them and move on instead of quitting. My advice for any kid who's trying to think up ideas or start a business is that have fun with it. Any idea is good. Just go with it and have fun and don't get stressed about it. So that's probably the worst thing you can do. We have a website, flosscottoncandy.com. We have an Instagram page. We do events. We have this whole cotton candy kitchen. None of those things I would have been able to experience if we hadn't gone for it and started our own business. So I think that's really cool. Thanks for watching this roundtable on entrepreneurship. We want to hear about your stories of entrepreneurship. So if you can let us know on social media or email us or send us pictures, that'd be great. We'd love to be inspired by those or see how this show has inspired you. Daniel. Hi, Corinne. It's been a minute. I was watching the latest episode on entrepreneurship and I liked it. No. But. There it is. You didn't highlight Corinne's corn dogs nearly enough. They're cheaper. Did you just call to shamelessly plug your corn dog stand? No. Yes. Buy Corinne's corn dogs. They're cheaper. Anything else, Corinne? I'm so into competition now, I'm also thinking about starting a competing cartoon where two twins learn about communism. We could call it Turtle Twins. Yeah, I mean, CNN would totally pick that up. Oh, and one more thing. In the episode, you feature Ben Franklin. Daddy says the founding fathers were flawed. And your daddy is perfect? Yes. I mean, maybe. I mean, we recognize that every historical guide we meet in this show has flaws. We all do. Some of the Founding Fathers were very flawed, but every one of them stood for great truths we can learn from too. So instead of erasing history completely, we choose to highlight the good when we see it. In short, sounds like you're going to get canceled. It's hard to cancel a show that's funded entirely by crowdfunding investment and fans who buy merch. Whatever.